Hello, welcome back to Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by our wonderful producer, Brian Atkins. Whew, we have a doozy of a show for you today with my guest, Dr. Frank Anderson. If you are a parent with whether they're little kids, medium-sized kids, big kids, whether there's a lot of tension, a little tension, they've gone no contact, you've gone no contact, you're mad at your parents, you're trying to forgive your parents, any of those scenarios, this show is for you. It is so chock full of powerful stories and actionable, practical takeaways. I hope you give it a listen because I emerged a much calmer parent and a much more grateful daughter. So let me introduce my guest, Frank Anderson. I am delighted to welcome my guest, Dr. Frank Anderson. Frank is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist, speaker, therapist, author, and trauma specialist who has studied neuroscience and trauma treatment for over 30 years. Frank recently released a beautiful book called To Be Loved, A Story of Truth, Trauma, and Transformation, which has been praised and endorsed by many thought leaders and clinicians, including Bessel van der Kolk, the New York Times bestselling author of the wonderful book, The Body Keeps the Score. Welcome, Frank. Thanks for coming on Open Relationships. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Super excited about this conversation. Oh, same. And this book is so beautiful. It's so moving. I saw a lot of myself in there um, in a lot of really challenging ways. So uh, <laughs> oh, we're going to get into it. And I love hearing that. I have to tell you, it's one of the most uh, meaningful things about writing this book is to hear the way people of all walks of life with all different histories are relating to these universal themes that I put out in my life. So it really warms my heart to hear that. Thank you so much. Yeah, for... well, and huge props to you for being so courageous and so open. I cringed a little bit at times and, yeah. and you know, and then I was like, oh, I'm not alone. So what I'd yeah. love to do, I'd love to together create a, um, uh, a a bit of that of that background for the rest of the people listening or watching who haven't read the book yet because I think that context will be really really informative so yeah. I'll I'm gonna give it a go and you you help me out over here so you go. you talk about growing up in in Chicago uh in the 60s uh being um uh, required to go to what is now probably called conversion therapy as a six-year-old boy um, because you were playing with the wrong toys. You were busted playing with the Barbie dream house or, you know, playing with girl, yep. girl toys. Yep. Uh, so from the age of six to 12, you yep. went, you know, it is just this really kind of ex difficult experience for you to go by yourself to see this doctor once a week for six years. And then in the meantime, you suffered from serious verbal and physical abuse from your dad. Um, you had a, uh, a, a, dysfunctional like a, a close relationship with your mom but a dysfunctional relationship with your mom and yep. to over and you felt unloved by your dad and so to overcome all that you became a uh, hyper overachiever all right I'm, yep. I'm, I'm getting all of it right you became a hyper totally. to overcome it all i know well and that <laughs> and listen that i can relate i can relate to that and i know all a right. lot of people can so i, I do want to give this context yeah you, you worked you super hard you wanted to be loved so what you did to to get to earn your love, because in your family, a lot like mine, love has to had to be earned. Yes. So you to earn your love, you were a superstar student, you busted your ass, you got yep. into medical school, and then you not only got into medical school, but you were in you know, selected by Harvard yep. Medical to do your residency. You That's kicked right. ass there. I mean, you you won awards yep. all along the way. Yeah. You you went through a couple of challenging relationships, including getting married to a woman. Yeah, she did on her and, and found out that you're gay, yeah. and ended up in a beautiful relationship. I'm dying to be Michael. I want to go double dating with you guys one day. Um, <laughs> found you know developed and meanwhile went through a ton of therapy. Yeah, had uh, through a surrogate had kids of your own. Yeah, and then had your ass kicked again by. Yeah having kids of your own and realized yeah. you, the, you know, the trauma was, um, you know, kind of moving through you or projecting through you onto your kids and 
freaking painful and relatable ways. Yeah. And and not to give too much away, uh, but you were able to, I mean, it, this was so moving to me. And again, so similar um, to make real peace with your parents, yeah. with your family, but particularly with a freaking abusive dad. You were able to to see his humanity, to forgive him, to find compassion for him. And, and I mean, to me, the, the the beauty in all this is along with yourself along the way. And that's where the kind of the byline of your story, um, a story of truth, trauma, and transformation. Yeah. You've transformed yourself. 100%. But it's been a freaking ass kicking <laughs> battle. And so first of all, I just want to say thank you for being so courageous and so brave. Um, I mean, when I think about, uh, you know, alcoholism and abuse and the various ways that that innocent children um, experience trauma. And even I love your neighbor, Mr. O'Connor, like this yeah. kind of asshole guy yeah. who decades later right. confessed to you what he experienced because you made it safe for him. And I want to come back to this, but I, I, I tee that up out fr up front because I'm going to start. I always like, let me start with me. Um, I I've made the mistake of saying, ah, oh, that person's such an asshole. Yeah. Right. But we don't know what's going on with them. And I, I just, I say that up front because for everybody listening, it's like, we're so quick to judge. Oh, that person's a jerk. Oh, that person's, you know, terrible. And, and yet we don't know their story. We don't know what caused them so much heartache to cause them to behave in a way. And as parents, I think it's deeply humbling when we, and this is where I really, I guess I, I want to start the questions with, because I have found myself similarly reenacting some of the things that were really hard for me growing up, getting yelled at and so forth. I came from a, a family of addiction. You know, I'm, I, I always say I'm a like overachiever, workaholic, yep. like so many of those things that yeah. you did to prove yourself. Yep. And that, and it totally, I mean, it's like, why, why do we continue to promulgate or continue to repeat these patterns, both in our own lives, as well as then why do we end up shouting at and being dysfunctional with our kids because like you i've done a massive amount of work on myself yeah and i still fuck it up that's and right and i'm like in like kind of a just i mean just to be again really really honest um i've really gotten into it with one of my sons yeah. in the last couple of days yeah i feel freaking terrible like right. i feel terrible you know what first of all andrea let me just say that is the best summary of this book i've heard so far like Ta-da. Yeah, you win. Honestly, I've done so many podcasts and shows and things like this around all the press around the book release. And that was a beautiful summary. Like, I love I your book. I want everybody who is listening to this podcast to buy it for yourself and buy it for a sibling or or a, a friend because it is so relatable and you are so honest. Yep. Right. And even if the even if you're OK, I didn't I wasn't raised in Illinois. I was raised in Georgia or whatever. Yeah. Like those things don't matter. The universal experiences that you had to, yeah. to, you know, being, you know, being abused and people were abused in different ways. But what you talk about and how you've recovered and then and how you have been able to transform with your parents yeah. and with your kids and even your partner. It's like, oh, I want to do that, too. So I'm so happy to have you on. Yeah. So, so yeah. why, why do we repeat yes. these things even when we freaking know better? It's a Can great we just stop? question. It's a great, great question. And like, excuse me, nobody in, from my perspective, nobody knows better than a damn Harvard trained psychiatrist who does this for a living. Thank right? you. And then I know. able to come home and repeat what was done to me was mortifying like mortifying. I, I, I write that. about this in the book. That's when yeah. I was suicidal. I like, I'd rather be dead. I mean, the whole yeah. reason I had kids was to give them a different experience than the one that I had growing up, right? That was the whole point. And then to find myself repeating the very thing that was done to me was just, there was nothing worse, nothing worse, you know? And uh, the thing is this, I, it's a great question. And, um, and, and you relate to Mr. O'Connor, it's connected to Mr. O'Connor because in my experience, anybody who has been victimized mm -hmm. absorbs victim energy 
And, mm -hmm. but I should say this, anybody who's been traumatized mm -hmm. experiences, holds victim energy, but they oh, also I... absorb perpetrator energy. Oh, right. Okay. okay. Everybody okay. experiences trauma, has, holds victim energy and absorbs perpetrator energy. And if you don't acknowledge your perpetrator energy, your shadow side, whatever you want to call it, you will repeat it. Ugh, That's the okay. deal. Okay. Even if you're a damn Harvard trained psychiatrist who helps Who's people. Who's done a ton of therapy, therapy oh with, God, right. with the, the giants. I mean, Richard right. Schwartz with IFS and, and right. Bessel, like. The other cult. Yeah. And I it just love. Right. I love your humility yeah, because 100%. it's like you should know better, right? Yes. And yet you still F it up. Yeah. 100%. Yes, so that's what about exactly the rest right. of us? It, well, and that's part of what it is for me is like we are all the same. That was another thing, you know. I've been like, oh, you're a trauma expert. Oh, it, you're one of them. You're in academia. You're a Harvard, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, and we're all the same. Like I can't tell you yeah. how many conferences I've been to where I'm the expert, we're the expert, and you're the patient, the client, yeah. the victim. So, yeah, no. superior versus yeah. inferior, right? Superior that versus inferior. It's the trauma dynamic. It's a yeah. power differential. So part of writing this was mm -hmm. to dispel the power differential. Like, hello, everyone. I may have gone to trauma. I may have gone to Harvard, and I'm an expert, and I am reenacting my trauma just like everybody else was. It was yeah. super important for me to, to put in that. And boy, there were moments, you know, moments of like panic when I would be writing something, you know, no. three, I'm three o'clock in the morning, waking up and like, oh my God, am I really going to talk about cruising in a bathroom and being exposed to somebody like, you know, during a study break? Oh my yeah. God. Right? Like, and so, but it felt really important. It felt like truth is the antidote to trauma. Yeah. Right. Truth is the antidote to trauma. So I really felt it was important to be honest and truthful about what I've done as well as what was done to me because we can't heal, in my opinion, until we acknowledge both sides in everyone. Yeah. In our perpetrators, we've got to acknowledge the vulnerability and the victimness in them as well as the perpetrator energy in them and in ourselves because if we've been violated we hold victim and perpetrator energy and that's what mr o'connor you know he was kind of this insurrection touting guy you know oh my god i went to the insurrection how cool. homophobic homophobic comments to a little kid i did my yeah. brother like what does he mean by fudge packer like yeah. right I'm like i think he means this like you know homophobic from the get-go you know always was creeped out and oh by the way he dressed in drag in halloween like how crazy, like how, talk about the duality in all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Him. And then at the, you know, towards the end when my dad was ill, comes over to the house and tells me about his trauma history. I'm just like, oh my goodness, we are so alike. Even though on the surface, we look so different. Well, and what what is so remarkable to me about what you shared, and I guess a, a few things. Um, yeah. Truth is the antidote to trauma. And for me, what I keep coming back to, I mean, I have apologized to my one of my kids, like not kidding, like yeah. five times in the last 24 hours. I'm telling yeah. you, it's been rough. Right. But I keep saying to myself, Andrea, accountability starts with you. Yeah. And so I, I hadn't heard this, so you must acknowledge your your shadow side and yeah. that that this idea that anyone traumatized traumatized will absorb both the victim and perpetrator energy and to to get that intellectually and now say okay now i now i can work with that so right. i i'm super grateful for that and and so to me it's like always back to how can i be accountable and be you know what what you did yourself finding that forgiveness for yourself finding that compassion and again our stories are similar my relationship with my parents has similarly transformed and so beautifully yeah. I have the most amazing conversations with my dad now because I don't come from a place of blame and anger. And like right. you, you right. did your work. Right. You became forgiving of yourself. You sought to find compassion. And mm -hmm. by the way, you had it rougher than I did. Like, not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah. what's amazing to me and what I just really want to drive home for people 
who struggle with this stuff is I feel like when you do your own work and when you show up in that in that open hearted way that your dad, I mean, your dad literally said, I wasn't the dad you needed or wanted. I mean, it's like such a beautiful way of being open and vulnerable with you. And Mr. O'Connor, you know, because yeah. you made it safe yeah. for these people to open up to you, like you said in the book, I changed and they changed, but I always right. say someone's got to go first. And so often right. we're waiting for the other person to go first. Right. You went first. Yes. I don't know why. Did that you work? Know, I think about resilience. I always, that word is always kind of elusive to me. Like, cause I, for whatever reason, have an enormous amount of resilience and what are all the factors? There's a lot of research and studies about what resilience really means, you know? Okay. Um, you know, and I don't know. It, it is that one person who believed in you. It mm -hmm. is the temperament and what you're born with. It is the way you learn from experiences. I always say we every moment is an opportunity to repeat, repress, or repair. Oh, like, right, right. Right. Repeat, repress, or repair. We always have these moments and and for whatever reason, I just was always in repair mode, like yeah. striving, striving. And I think it was this desire to be loved, honestly. You know, I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning and do my homework. And I, you know, I was always, you know, talk about therapy. Somebody asked me how, I'm like, oh my God, I have to count up how many years I've been in therapy, like 33 years, right? One time it was 11, 11 years for five times a week. Like, I don't recommend that for everyone. That's not what I'm saying is the solution to healing. But I had this internal drive to better, better, better myself. Um, and whatever that is, I want people to know that it's possible for everyone. I really do. I don't think you have to do go to that degree, mm -hmm. but I think everybody has the opportunity. You know, it's so, I'm going to, this is maybe unpopular, but I'm 61 and I don't care anymore about being popular. Like it's so lovely to not care. Uh, like, yeah, it's liberating. Well, you know? to call it, but that's to getting to tell the truth. And right. That's, that's exactly right. right. You don't have to agree, but I'm going to share my view now. Yeah. I feel comfortable. Yeah. I think what's going on politically is a mess, and I think it's all rooted in trauma. I think mm -hmm. both sides, just like me and Mr. O'Connor, both sides come from wounded places, and both sides have their way of fixing the problem. Yeah. We don't see the commonality. All we see is the difference because neither side has acknowledged the harm they've done. This is this is really something that feels important because no side is right and both sides have value. But mm -hmm. we're, we don't have the capacity to see that when we hold on to our wrongness and need to mm -hmm. blame the other. Then we're Isn't stuck that in that dynamic. And it yeah. doesn't matter what we're talking about. So I think we would be a very different world if we acknowledged, you know, what we've done, what was done to us, um, who did what, and what was done to them, you know? And I think there's this culture right now that is still perpetuating the us and them, the us and them dynamic. Yeah, the otherizing. And totally. Yes. Huge. Well, and I, I totally agree with you. And in part, that's why I wanted to bring up Mr. O'Connor. And you even talk about your, you know, you're a liberal Northeasterner. Yeah. Your brother yeah. Ross is a hunter fisher from now in Mississippi. Mississippi. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And definitely leans uh, conservative and, and so forth. And yet you guys are best friends. You yep. have each other's backs. Yeah. And I, I'm with you. I mean, I that was noteworthy to me because when I think about the divide in our society and it's getting worse sure. it's yeah it's back to we do you know we do have more in common than we have that's different and yet this otherizing this blaming yes. and de i mean we dehumanize each other because it's like well you're I the you're clearly the problem if you like those those yeah, you know, uh, values or you like those politicians, well, then you must be amoral or unethical or whatever. It's so I think we're so basic in our human capacity to hold complexity mm -hmm. because the reality is, can you hold the complexity about the other side? Mm -hmm. Even more important, can you hold the complexity about yourself? Right. What do you right. mean by that? Can you hold the complexity? Yeah, like. Like, I'm a wonderful, incredible human being, 
And I also can be mean and harmful and um, not great. In yeah, my, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the, that's the truth. Talk to, you know, I did this ep a podcast episode recently with my, one of my, with a, one of my companies, the Trauma Institute, with my son, Transgenerational mm -hmm. Trauma. And it was amazing to mm -hmm. kind of hear him talk about the ways I've been an amazing father and the ways I've been a really crappy father. Do you know what I mean? And to hear- I was going to ask you about their response to the book. So keep going. Yeah, to hear him. And I feel so grateful. You know, there was a moment probably a year ago before the book came out, he was so angry at me and he wouldn't talk to me for probably three or four months. Like he would talk to my husband, wouldn't talk to me. It was so Is this Brett? No, this is Logan. Oh, 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 okay. Oldest. And then okay. at one point he was at the gym and he just texts me this litany of complaints. You did this and you were controlling and you were this and you were that and you were this. And I was like, you're absolutely right, honey. I am so sorry. Yeah. Which totally disarmed him. Like, he was not expecting that. I'm like, you are right. I did do harmful things. And I'm so glad you're able to tell me that. And I am so sorry. Mm. You know, like I'm a human being and I did my best and I am sure I messed up, you know? And that was huge for our relationship, for him to be able to hear me instead of, do you know how much I did for you? Do you know how hard it was to raise you? Like okay. all the defensive crap that people get into. I'm guilty uh, of that. I mean, right? again, in the spirit of keeping it real, like I, you know, I spent so much money and I put so much time in and, and I, I feel like I come from this place of righteousness, right? if I'm being honest. That's and, right. And, you know, and I'll be like, you know, I'm, I expect more respect from you. Right. And I'm listening to myself going, what the F? <laughs> right. Well, and my husband was like, why are you telling him that? It's only going to give him more power. And I'm like, no, it's not going to give him more power. In fact, oh. it's going to validate his experience okay. and that is going to open the door for our connection. And it did. You know what I mean? It was one of the things my parents never did. You know, one of the things I talk about in the book, I had seven years of no contact with them when I was an adult. Right. Yeah. And that was because I needed to create a boundary because I wasn't strong enough to stand up to them, but they were not capable of hearing me. Yeah. And so I held that very closely for myself to say, mm -hmm. I am not going to repeat that. If he, you know, no matter Harvard, whatever, and no matter how hard I tried, he had an ex he's had experiences where I have failed him. Yeah. And some of them were even, some of them were more conscious than others. You know, like I wasn't aware of how having a second son who had special needs really dominated our life for a while and, yeah. and had my older son feel neglected. Like, yeah. did I neglect him? Hell no. Did he have an experience of being neglected? 100% yes, mm -hmm. right? And that's the complexity I'm talking about, Andrea, is like people have a hard time holding the and of other people as well as ourselves. Well, and I think, yeah, and I, I think, it, you know, again, speaking uh, uh, about, you know, myself and, and my observations, it's so, it's so painful and scary yeah. To, yeah. to say I'm, I'm wrong and I yeah. fucked up. And yet when you do, I'm glad you that mentioned. is your like only path to liberation, Yeah. except it's the scariest freaking thing to do to, to tell those truths, right? Because then we're totally vulnerable, totally exposed. Masks are off. Right. And yeah. we don't know how the other person's going to react. Right. Because yeah. they may say, you, yeah, you're, you know, rather than being gracious and accepting the right. apology or accepting the, you know, I'm trying to be accountable and vulnerable. Then they just tell me how terrible I am. And I think it's so much harder for people like us who have experienced so much trauma where we are are so aware of how painful and hurtful it is. And then we F it up. That yeah. feeling of shame and guilt. It's like. I like you got to be pretty brave to say, all right, I'm willing to do that. But the opposite, you know, the, the alternative means that you're alone. Yeah. Right. Means that you're, you're hiding something means that, you know, you have, have made a rational choice. That's actually totally irrational when it comes to being healed and whole and connected deeply with other people. Well, and here's the thing that I learned. And I, this was a surprise to me. Like I didn't expect this to happen. It was a gift. I would say a surprise, but a gift. Um, the way, I, you know, and my son was, you're defensive and you're controlling. 
and I actually was like exactly in what the ways you're talking about. Like, wait mm-hmm. a minute, blah, blah, blah. What, you know how much yeah. I've done for you? You know, blah, blah, blah. What I realized was that it was, and this was for me, this was the way it worked for me. So it doesn't have to be this way for everyone. It was only in my ability to forgive my father that I was able to see the humanity in him that then enabled me to forgive myself and then admit that I am wrong. Like it's so easy for me to say I'm sorry now Mm. because I have forgiven somebody who's harmed me. Because if you hold resentment for someone who's harmed you, you can't really take accountability for the ways you've harmed somebody. So it was only in my capacity to love him, rise above, forgive him, that opened the door Mm -hmm. for me to truly be human and perpetrator-ish also and say, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're right, I'm sorry, you're right. So it was a really, I was not, people get so weird about forgiveness, they freak out around it, you know? And Mm -hmm. I was so struck that how do you take responsibility for something you've done if you can't forgive somebody who's harmed you? Because then you, you're you doing the same thing that they're doing in a different form, right? So it's so tied together. And I, did, I didn't learn that in psychotherapy class. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't learn yeah. that at Harvard. I learned that through my life experience. Oh God, there's so much there. Um, which it, well, and just let let's pick up from right there because you know to your point that you are this very very accomplished academic. Why isn't that taught to clinicians? Because because that exactly. feels like like even to your point, like our society is breaking down. Yes. Because that thing that is so freaking basic is it's like this thing of mysticism. Right. And it shouldn't be a thing of mysticism. It should be like this is what we do from the moment we're born in kindergarten, you know, in all these places, because relationships are the air that we breathe. Yeah. And we're we're breathing very polluted, rarefied air if we don't have this insight. I'll tell you, this is something and this is where I go a little spiritual because I I certainly did not grow up spiritual or religious in any way. I learned Uh that from my husband, honestly. And I, you know, my dad hated religion, even though we were Mm. raised Catholic. But I, here's, I went to Cambodia and China last year to teach. Mm -hmm. And I was, we were spent time in the killing fields in Cambodia. Mm. And I was just so struck with the existence of evil. Like, you know, you're at the killing fields and five people out of 20,000 survive. No. Right. Okay. And, and yeah. it's in the midst of these amazing, glorious, religious Hindu and Buddhist temples, like literally down the street. Right. And to see the juxtaposition of love and hate was really um, disarming for me, you know, and I was like, that- we are. It takes it's hard for us to learn as yeah. a culture and as a society, like why is Israel and Palestine still today engaged in this kind of battle, mm-hmm. right? So I think we as a culture, we as humans are really in this repetitive learning cycle mm-hmm. around harm versus being harmed. As I say, everybody has a trauma history. I think we're here. I think the purpose of why we're here is to grow and evolve as a soul. And I think in order to do that, you need to acknowledge, you need to harm and be harmed in order to grow. And not everybody chooses to grow. Right. No, it is it is a choice, right? I agree with you right? that the the point, I think the point of being human is is, is to love and grow. And I think to really right. only, also, really. Andrea, it might also be to harm. Think about that. Oh God! Not oh! You just ninja moved me. Uh, I did because listen, I, right? Totally. Who, who, right. I, this is where the othering comes in, right? Well, I I have this philosophy around a uninvited Buddha concept, right? right. And I've since the time my kids were little, I always called them my little Buddhas because they yes. had so freaking much to teach me. Right. Right. 
yes. and other yeah. people so much to teach me. And it's like, yeah. oh my God, this person is ma is making me, air quotes, making me right. crazy right now. I yeah. guess there is something and I feel hurt by yeah. them. Now yeah. I'm hitting back. Yes. So, and it, so it's mutual, right? Not only do I yeah. have an uninvited Buddha that has something to teach me, when I'm hurting my husband or hurting a, in a, you know, yes. even if it's not intentionally, but right. because I've got the perpetrator, yes. that it's my job to teach the other person, yeah. okay, here's how you need to be compassionate. If if you want to evolve, yes. right? Yeah. And it's challenging and it's hard. I am yeah. not saying it's easy. So there's by no means do I want to be flippant yeah. about the challenge this is in, yeah. in us looking at ourselves, taking responsibility, truly acknowledging the ways we've harmed ourselves and others. Yeah. You know, and the way we've been harmed by others. I think, you know, it is, I think I have this phrase from my, uh, my second book, Transcending Trauma, trauma blocks love and connection. Mm -hmm. And it's love and connection that heals trauma. Uh -huh. And both are true. It is this cycle. So you know, the, the experiences, whether we're perpetrator or victim, blocks access to love and connection. But it's love and connection that heals. Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the great irony. Uh, I want to come back and talk about your recommendations for healing trauma. But before we do, I wanted to rewind just for a moment, yeah. you know, about all the weirdness around forgiveness. And I, yeah. you know, there are a ton of memes and all that stuff. Yeah. And on the one hand, it is profoundly liberating. But I wanted to ask, you said you first learned how to uh, forgive your dad or figured out how to forgive your dad. And then it was that, then you could forgive yourself. I think a lot of people would say, no, 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 you've got to forgive yourself first. Or is that an academic, like who cares? Yeah. Well, you know what? It's interesting. So that was, that's, I that, that was the way it worked for me. Okay. okay. And does it, it, it you know, I think society and culture pushes forgiveness prematurely. I think religious organizations yeah. and institutions forgive, 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 forgive first, forgive first. Yeah. My experience has been this, and this is what I now teach. Heal first. Oh, and, and right. Choose to forgive second. Okay. Okay. Some people never choose to forgive. Okay. That's up to them. For me, forgiveness is about the person doing the forgiving not the person being forgiven because yeah, you know yeah. that, but because religious institutions, Catholicism, the 12 step program ask for forgiveness. If you harm I'm like, well, that doesn't really work in my view. Mm. Okay. I'm not going to mm. ask for forgiveness. I'm forgiving you, but I first need to release what happened to me. This is the healing trauma first mm -hmm. before I can engage in what you did to me, the yeah. relational piece. So this is what I say, heal first and then engage in forgiveness. You benefit. Yeah. Like there was nothing more freeing. I can feel it now as we're talking. Mm -hmm. When I was organizing my dad's funeral, I felt love for him. Mm -hmm. And it was the ultimate freedom. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, all that you did to me, is no longer affecting me because mm -hmm. I am loving you. And it mm -hmm. shows me that I'm no longer affected by what you mm -hmm. did to me. So powerful for me. It's now, so, I mean, it's agency. And only, I always, I'm a believer, like, you can yeah. only give yourself yeah. that agency. And here's the thing. I think the, the kind of the cluster F, if you will, is yep. that we're all waiting to be empowered. It's right. like, and we're waiting for that other person to go right. first. Well, good luck with that, right? Yeah, it doesn't, but that's why I'm saying it. I, that has not been my experience. Now, it could be somebody else's experience, you know, and I worked a lot. I I did a lot of therapy before I was able to forgive my dad. So was I primed for it? Sure. Would I have not re been so receptive if I hadn't done all the work I've done? Maybe, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I... Uh, even with all the work I did, there was a piece of me, and this is not popular in the psychotherapy worlds because I did a lot of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. I was still holding on to something. Even was I might my life was better. I had a lovely husband. I had beautiful kids. My life was a lot better, but there was still something unresolved between me and my dad. 
no matter until, how much- Until what? Until he died or until- he until, until him and I had a corrective experience. That's okay. what the corrective experience is key in trauma healing across the board. I teach this now. Yeah. But we, and not everybody gets a corrective experience. Like I felt loved from him <laughs> and for him. And that was a corrective moment that transformed everything for me. And that didn't happen in all the therapy. No matter how much I loved myself, no matter how much I set boundaries and created a life that was good, I had a fantastic mm -hmm. life. I didn't, I was still holding something and maybe other people can let go easier than me. I'm aware of that. You know what I mean? Um, it was hard for me because I wanted this so badly and I was great. I was, it was a gift. To but hang on. I want to chime in. I, I have an observation and then Go I ahead. have a question. Go ahead. Uh, and I, I kind of touched on this uh, toward the beginning. I would conjecture from reading your book uh, that you facilitated that corrective experience. Experience. That's, I think because that's because you yeah. made it safe enough, both yeah. for both of your parents yes. to kind of come clean. Yeah. I and think you couldn't true. have done that without the work you did. Because yeah. if you're showing up like you son of a bitch, he's right. gonna be like, "Fuck you!" Yeah, now here's the wall. Right. Enjoy you got it. Hundred percent. No, I think you're right. That's the I did take responsibility for my own healing, and I did show up with love and compassion. I and, did, and that. That to me is like the the killer app. It's the meta game changer yeah. that when you show up with that, where you've done your work, you've done your healing, you don't yeah. come in with venom, you come in with an open heart. Yes. We feel that. It's in our yeah. body language. It's in yeah. the way we look at each other. You talk about one of, you know, the last times you were together with your family, how it was like, wow, this is a, your dad, I think, said this is the best time we've ever had together. Yeah. Yes. And that I want to give you full props for. And I really emphasize this for everybody, including myself, because that's what we can control. Right. Right. And if he never and if he just still stayed kind of, yeah. you know, disconnected from you or whatever, you may not have gotten that corrective experience. But he sure as heck never would have had you yeah. not shown up differently. Hundred percent. You are you are absolutely right on that. And, you know, I don't I'm I'm not great at giving myself credit for what I have done, but you're absolutely right because that energy of love and compassion is contagious. Yes. It truly really is contagious. Um, and I helped, I knew like one of the trips and I talk about this, this was another gift. Like my mom would leave aside and he was always so sick. And I came in one weekend and I'm like, go get your hair done, go ahead. And as soon as she left to get her hair done, him and I talked and I helped him die. I did. He when, was reviewing his life. He was talking about all the good times we had. And, you know, he needed to do that. And she couldn't do that with him. Yeah. He needed him, you know, and, and he felt me holding that space for him. And I was the only person that he really did that with that I'm aware of, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it was a gift for both of us, you know, um, so, yeah, I think you're right. The way we show up with people who have harmed us does have a factor, is a factor. Ma I mean, massive. It can be yeah. absolutely massive to give them permission to just to to be open. And when I think about, you know, you, you again, you talk about how how really abusive he was and then yeah. and at his funeral. And again, I just want to keep it real how all these people came up and talked about how generous he was generous. and how amazing he was. And he wasn't like that to you. And I, it sounds like maybe he wasn't quite as tough on your siblings and no. maybe not even close to as tough, but they also grow up, grew up in, in a very toxic, you know, to right. see somebody victimized that sucks. Yeah. yeah. And yet he, he was a complex person that no doubt, you know, if, if, you know, when you meet him in heaven or, you know, on the other side, wherever you meet, for him to say, oh, Frankie, here's what happened to me growing up. That's you right. Know what I mean, because that like just like we're talking about with our own kids as yeah. enlightened and as as deliberate and intentional as we are, that we still I mean, you, listen, you're obviously not physically or verbally abusing your kids, yeah. but you still get dysregulated with them sometimes, just like I do sometimes with mine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and you know what? It's interesting. 
up until a couple of years, I do very rarely. Well, it's interesting. Here's what I'll say. So fascinating. Uh, continuing to keep it real. I don't with my older son anymore. Like him and I have worked through something very powerful and he had the room to be angry and felt safe enough to express his anger. And I was able to tolerate it because of the work I did mm -hmm. with um, my dad and his anger that my oldest son and I have a very close, very yeah. intimate relationship in a way that is so beautiful. Yeah. This side is my younger son. So he's 16, he's on the spectrum, and I am, like uh, you said a couple days ago, like a couple days ago, me, happened with <laughs> me, him, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, because what I was aware of in him is because of his spectrum stuff, he's super controlling because he needs to control the world. Mm. And what I've noticed is he's controlling, I feel controlled by him because of his need to control his environment. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, great. Another damn learning experience. Here mm -hmm. we go. And I am, a, I am now actively working on holding space for him to be, con quote, be controlling, can keep yeah. him, himself safe without mm -hmm. being activated by it myself. Cause I was totally getting, I'm like, nobody tells me what to do. Do you know how old I am? Do you know how many years? You know, I went to Harvard. <laughs> or, you know, I'm a Harvard trained like, psychologist. It was so funny yeah. because he's telling me how to drive. And here's oh. the ridiculous. I'm like, do you know how many years I've been driving? How many years have you driven? Here, yeah. get me in the wheel. I'm like, what are you doing, Frank? You're I know, we become, we become <laughs> seven year olds, right? Why the fuck do we do that? My husband, I got so mad at him. He said, would you would you guys stop fighting? You sound like a bunch of siblings. Oh, did that make me mad? Oh, you my know? God. Hilarious. Zing. Good job, true. Michael. But it was true. It was yeah. true because I was I was triggered and activated by him being who he is and yeah. how it activated me being controlled by my dad. So I'm actively working. I'm like second round. I'm like, I learned about anger from, like you said, your kids are your best teachers. I learned about anger through my relationship with my oldest son. He was such an angry kid. And uh, now I'm learning about control um, yeah. from my youngest. And I'm so aware of these lessons, you know? So it's it's good to be on the other side of something, but boy, is it uh, like takes a long time. It's I mean, but that that is that's the the path of mastery, right? And I say that right. with no yeah. Yes. You know, sanctimony right. or bleh, like you're really it's like, yeah. oh, can we just be done with this already? And it's like, yeah, it's no, never, it's never done. <laughs> like, that's the other thing. Like, will I have difficult moments with my oldest son? One hundred percent. Like, this is the thing yeah. that I've been aware of. I used to, Andrea, I used to talk about permanent healing, which I think is hogwash. Like, I don't think there's any such thing as permanent healing. Right. What I do know is once I release a layer of something. I'm no longer carrying that energy, right, right, that stuff. And when yeah. something else comes up again, it activates a different dimension of the mm -hmm. same hurt. So mm -hmm. there's an evolution in my experience of healing. Is it ever done? I don't think so. That's well, I, I experienced that. Yeah, no, I just I really appreciate the validation. I know you know we kind of keep it's kind of recursive. We keep coming back for those of us who are so committed to yes. our paths of healing and particularly as parents and how yes. freaking painful it is to say, okay, five steps forward and four and a half steps back. Here we go again. I mean, it's humbling. And I, that's what I, I kind of, I got to this point this morning, yeah. writing, I write my journal every day and it was like, oh, Andrea, give yourself some grace because the path of healing isn't linear, but we want it to be. And that is not wisdom. It's like, you know what wisdom is? Is saying, oh, here we go again. Maybe yeah. I can do it a little differently. Do you know, this is just a question, not yeah. to put on the stop, spot, but I guess I am. Yeah, do yeah. you know who inside is being hurt by what's happening between you and your son? Like, have you gotten beyond, like, beyond the reaction, which is our protection? Like, do you even okay. have contact yet? And the reason I'm asking you is mm -hmm. because that is what happened to me recently with my youngest son. I was like, mm -hmm. I went for a hike in the canyon and I was like, oh, I connected 
to the hurt part of me that kept getting activated by his need to control. So do you have access yet? So how do I do that? And I, yeah. I, I would love a little mini coaching session and I'm sure a lot yeah. of people are like, come on, tell them, you know, tell them what it is because you don't know. So can we, well, can you walk me no, through it? See, and I can't tell you, but it, but oh. there is, I can't tell you it's about helping you okay. get that internal exploration because the first thing is validating your response to your son. You have to validate the part of you that's self-righteous, that's pissed off, that's angry. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, because that part shows up in you for a reason. So you have to be like, tell me more. Why was it important to yell? What made you so mad? Like you have mm -hmm. to validate the part of you that lost it mm -hmm. in order for that part to trust you enough to reveal who it's protecting inside. That's okay. the way we do it. That's the that's the path is like I had to, I was really validating how controlled I felt, how angry I was. How, like I did that process. I did, went on a hike, woke up at five, six in the morning. I'm like, you, to send a note out for a hike. My husband knew what the hell was going on. You yeah. know, like you need to go. Yeah, go do your work, buddy. You know, right, and right. I did, I was like, oh, and then when I got in touch, when I got in touch with the part of me that was so, here's what I'll say, um, so affected by my dad's controlling behavior. The, and so it had, that had nothing to do with my son. It has everything to do with my history. When I connected to this little boy who was so wounded mm -hmm. by being verbally abused, it was then that I had compassion for my son and his sweet little innocent mm -hmm. autistic way of being in the world. Yeah. But it wasn't until I, because because when you stay in the anger, you're still in your protection and you've got to get beyond that protection to see, because once you connect with the vulnerability within you that gets activated, mm -hmm. then you can see your son. You know, I always tell people when I do parenting courses, don't re-engage with your children until you feel compassion for them. Mm. And that means you have to do your own work. Right. What's being activated in you. Right. Because we can we re-engage. I'm sorry what I did, but blah, 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 blah. It's like, You're right. no, that's 50%. You're not quite there yet. No, you know no, I mean? that, that can almost be even more damaging. Yeah, so rather it than, is. it's like, it's a little like gaslighting. Yeah, like you're yeah, under but. the... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but you're under yeah, the but. sort of the auspices of I'm I'm going to make the repair and I'm trying to you know do the right thing. Sure. Except now I'm justifying my bad behavior. Like hundred percent, hundred percent. So and and it's not, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm I'm going to get back to you. I need to figure out what's going on for me. Yeah, like what great modeling that is for our kids. What it, it's great outstanding. Model. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's where I mean I've I've taken solace in that. Where at times when I've lost it and then, yeah. then I make the apology and repair, it's like, yeah. okay, that that's real connection and yeah. repairing, you know, as much as I'd love just for them to have a friction-free childhood, it's like, okay, well, plan B is to be a real person yeah. that is at least trying to 100%. take accountability. But let me just rewind for a minute. So yes. you're saying, okay, I need to validate my response to myself. And I know you're saying you can't do it for me, but what, what question do I ask? And or what, what is that exercise that I, I and everybody listening can do when they lose it? And whether it's with their kid or a spouse or anybody, it, it's, can you it's just taking the time. I mean, yes, you can do that in therapy. So that if a therapist has this awareness, they're like, so why were you so angry? And so why was it important to be angry? And what was helpful about being angry? And, mm -hmm. you know, why did you yell at him? And what was he doing that was so horrible? Like you have to. And people could do this through writing and journaling, mm -hmm. meditation, any way, is learn from the part that reacted. Right. You need to I learn think. the positive intention of the uh -huh. part of you that reacted because it's trying to, it, it, it reacts to your son and it has nothing to do with your son. It yeah. reacts to your son because somebody inside of you got wounded, yeah. re-wounded, re-triggered, 
Okay. So yeah. until you, until you acknowledge with compassion, the reactivity in you and the, and the reason like, oh my gosh. So you yelled at him because you were protecting the little boy who was screamed at by your, my dad. Oh, oh, I get it. I appreciate you. Wow. Thank you. I get it now. Mm -hmm. right? And then that part who reacted relaxes and yeah. gives you access to the one inside. Yeah. To be like, there's a saying we have in IFS, internal family systems, when it's intense, it's yours. Oh, I love that. End of story. End of story. When it's intense, it's yours. No, oh, wow. Okay. I love yeah, that. And that's what I'm always looking for. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, that's it. It's a great hack. And as much as we want to say, point to the other yeah. person, yeah. everybody but me, everybody but me. It's like, but the, the only way I feel like you really can heal yourself is to say, yeah. I, I love the Taylor Swift. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's me. It's I'm the problem. It's me. Yeah. I mean, I've, you know, talked about this on the show a few times. Yeah. It's like, oh, frick. Thank you, Taylor yeah. Swift, for giving us permission to say, yeah. oh, yeah, it's me. That's exactly you know? right. That, that's the owning the part. That's owning that. And that, owning that, that becomes a super, I mean, I really, I have found, you know, as much as I've, I've screwed it up and, you know, gotten it right and screwed it up. I, I have found that that ends up being a superpower 100%. in time, right? 100%. Otherwise it's just like, you can't, you can't, you can't advance if you can't yeah. acknowledge it. It's like, you just remain stuck just like everybody else remains stuck. It's like, yeah. all right, well, stuck, I guess we're all just going to stay stuck. Like the other stuck and blaming yeah. the other side. Yeah. No, it's the ultimate agency. Okay. We're going to have to wrap in a few minutes. Yeah. I want to ask just in, you know, you talked about the heavy lifting you've done. Um, you've, you know, you, you as an instructor of IFS, internal family systems, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other things. What are the one or two or three ways either that you have been able to heal your trauma best, or what do you recommend to the people that you're helping yeah. right because there are a lot of options out there well it's interesting so a couple things i'll say one is that i really do feel called to move outside of the realm of psychotherapy and uh -huh. help the general public like i already am working on a, a new book deal honestly i just know the next book is how to help the general public heal from trauma i'm just clear nice. about that so mm -hmm. i do want to take the information within the realm of psychotherapy and translate it in a user-friendly way to the general public. So that's one thing that feels super important because there's a huge gap. There's so many people that don't have access to good trauma therapy, you know, okay. and if you're going to help the world heal, that needs to happen. The other thing I'll say is being somebody who's been teaching about neuroscience, of uh, PTSD and dissociation for years, who's trained in EMDR and sensory motor psychotherapy and IFS, I don't believe anymore in one model of therapy for trauma. I think it needs okay. to be integrated. I think integration okay. is really important. And that's one of the reasons I opened the Trauma Institute, which is an institute now for people to learn, therapists to learn about integrated trauma treatment and the general public to learn about healing. So mm -hmm. I really feel like you, in order to heal, you know, trauma gets stored in our thoughts and in our emotions and in our physical sensation. And we need a range of responses because no one thing fits anyone. Mm -hmm. and so I think integration is super important. So, you know, yes, there's ways to do this. There are not many resources for the general public yet mm -hmm. on how to do this. I just went to an event in Hawaii recently where there was somebody really cool stuff people were doing. One person was doing skateboard with teenagers and yeah. helping them learn difficult difficulties in I'm life, sure. skateboarding. Another person was kind of making as a fashion designer and she was making fashion clothing based on different types of emotion. And then you yeah. wear different clothing based on your different yeah. mood. Like, there's so many cool things happening out into the world. Um, that are kind of ways of healing outside of psychotherapy. And I kind of think that's the way to go. It's, it's not only in the therapy office. And here's what I'll say last thing. When you get flooded and overwhelmed and you lose your way, go get help. Yeah. Like, there's some things we can do on our own and there's some things we can't. And we, I want to teach people when you need to and when, when you could do it on your own. Let me, okay, last 
question. Um, when it comes to trauma, I mean, I feel like there are a lot of people who say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. What is your perception, having done this for a long time at the highest levels, what yep. percentage of people would you say have experienced trauma? I'm going to say 100% and people get pissed off about this. But here's oh. what I say. I say, have you ever had an overwhelming life experience? Uh-huh. And I'd never heard anybody say no. Mm. So people get triggered by the word trauma. Yeah. Not me. I'm not a, I'm not a vet. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have PTSD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so don't use the word trauma. Have you had an overwhelming life experience? And what yeah. kind of impact did that have on you? Oh, my father died. Oh, I was bullied. Oh, I blah, blah, blah. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I, I, like I said this earlier, I think that's why we're here is yeah. to experience overwhelming things to learn and grow and evolve from. So I think we've, I think it's part of the human condition. Uh, and I guess that's the good news and the bad news, right? That we yeah. can, if we can accept that that's the case rather than resist it, Right. Then we have a op beautiful opportunity to liberate ourselves and yeah. develop powerful connections to be vessels of compassion, sure. forgiveness versus yeah. saying, nope, not me. That's Just right. suffering over here. Don't no, don't yeah. look here. <laughs> that's and that's why I wrote the memoir is to show yeah. like, yeah, it's po healing's possible even when it's really bad. Yes, yes, yes. It is possible. Well, and that that's a great note to end on because that's what I, I just loved in your book that you had done all this work and you just walk the walk and talk the talk. And despite, you know, your own, you know, setbacks and so forth, that you really made profound changes in your life. Yeah. And I would contend that you really helped heal your parents. And, you know, you talk about the beautiful relationships you have with with your siblings and your, you know, your kids and yeah. your partner. And to me, that that gives me a profound amount of hope, especially given the um, the headwinds and heartache and abuse you suffered as a you know throughout your life. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. All right, Frank Anderson, to be loved: a story of truth, trauma, and transformation. And there is so much more. Um, is it is it frankanderson.com? I should have asked you your yeah. Uh, so website. Um, website is frankandersonmd.com. And I'm on all the social media channels to kind of, if you want to follow me there. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're awesome. And, and on, on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. You are brilliant, uh, Frank. Thank you so much. I really loved your book and I really love talking to you today. I hope you'll come back to Open Relationships. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you and all that you're doing. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Oh my gosh, love him. I, You know, it's interesting when you read a memoir that's especially one that's as personal and intimate as his, you really, you do feel a powerful sense of connection and then you meet him and just with that that warmth and that charm and that, you know, as my son says, the big brain, uh, what's not to love about Frank Anderson? Uh, but Brian, what were your one or two big takeaways? Is there something that you're like, yep, I'm doing this today and every day for the rest of my life? Well, I mean, first off, I, I have two things right off the top, which was one mad congratulations to you for his like um, he gave you props for giving the best recap of his oh. book slash life. That was uh, <laughs> yeah, he was definitely like she's done her research. Yeah, <laughs> she paid cool. attention. she's in it. Mm, thanks. <laughs> um, but in terms of, of stuff that I'll, I'll probably like need to to be mindful of. Um, and I feel like I've experienced them, but like corrective experiences, those like moments where like, I feel like the wires connect and you see someone for who they truly are, or you like, you go, oh, the reason you've been, you know, abusing the crap out of me is because this is how you have been desperate for love from your dad or whatever it might have been. You know what I mean? Like those experiences where you see someone like, I don't want to say like you soul read them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you, you those are the moments where I think I need to go like, oh, okay, like that's who this is. I need to not blame them for everything. You know, I need Did to that. understand them, which I Did thought them? was very, very moving. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. wisdom to me, right? And it's like, ooh, if we all made that our intention, what a different world we would live in. Yeah. What about you? Uh, whew. I loved how he talked about um, that anyone traumatized, which, as he said at the end, everybody's been traumatized to a certain extent, 
that everybody absorbs absorbs a certain degree of victim and perpetrator energy. I had never heard of it like that. But when I think about times when I'm aggressive and it's like, oh, well, there's logic to that. I, you know, as I always like to say, oh, I'm a type AAA areas. I come by it naturally. <laughs> but that, you know, that just understanding the psychology of that a little bit is both for me a bit freeing. And it's like, oh, OK, I can, you know, when I get in that dysregulated moment with whomever that I can go, OK, that's what's happening right now. I, I'm actually being the aggressor. And yeah. let me let me own that. And that, you know, similarly, what he was talking about, um, when it's intense, it's yours. Yeah. Like, yeah. Right. And own it. I mean, you know, he and I talked a lot about accountability and he said, truth is the antidote to, to trauma. So I think of these um, these bits that just go hand in hand. And then the last one, the idea of of him giving me permission and even more than permission, it urging me and urging all of us to validate our responses to ourselves rather than, because what I do, I, I get mad at, you know, you know, a child, my husband, you know, whomever. And, and then I feel guilty. Right. And rather than just slowing down and say, okay, what part of myself was feeling um, dismissed or disrespected or, you know, what part of myself was like he said, um, kind of needs uh, uh, had a positive intention right like that's kind of a ninja move to say okay this, something inside is actually doing something that is meant to be protective and meant right. to be positive and it's getting hijacked so let's slow down and rather than just continuing you know in my case and like so many of us um beat myself up when i get angry because it's like oh not that again i'm trying so hard not to but instead take that extra step to really understand, to inquire. And like he said, you got to show up, like if you're going to engage with your kids, you got to show up with compassion. You know, all of us have kids inside of us that um, have stuff to heal. So I feel like it's using that same advice to say, okay, let me show up, identify that that younger part of me that's feeling hurt or angry or, or whatever with compassion and understand it. And, and hopefully that can help uh mitigate that person needing like they need to to come back out again and again well and you just said like with the um mm -hmm. where you're like oh not that again like the there's no such thing as permanent healing also uh, like that was huge for me because i feel like that Jenny. yeah i mean you know you you i feel like you like pick an old scab or something accidentally and you're like oh this like i'm, I'm not over this yet it's been yeah. 20 years or whatever you know what i mean like uh I, and like, I don't know, like, that it's a constant process. It's not just poof, you're healed. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I, I, I love that. Yeah, I love that too. I'm glad you referenced that because I do think, and you know, I talked in the uh, discussion about we expect things to be linear and then have them behind us. And I feel like there's something um, really liberating to say, no, no, this is, I mean, it's like doing the laundry. Like there's <laughs> more, you know, making your dinner. Like every day, the, this is a stuff of life. And if you're lucky and wise, then- these opportunities for deeper healing, even as he was saying, you know, with his younger son who has control issues that Frank's like, oh, my God, yet another mountain to climb. Sure. And and as much as maybe that's not what we want, it's like, all right, let me not resist, but instead be open to that next level of, of mastery and open heartedness. And I'm sure like he described with his older son, Logan, where they have this really beautiful bond. My expectation is by him doing that work he will emerge with that bond with his son and i i think like that's our job as parents like do our own work and then we build the beautiful relationships that then hope hopefully lead to them having those beautiful relationships with their significant others and and kids and so forth so it, it really is a a higher calling for me totally Anyway, all right. Well, thanks for tuning in to another amazing episode of Open Relationships. Gosh, if you have suggestions or advice, please email us at openrelationships at your tango.com. We are so grateful for you when you subscribe, when you follow us, when you like us, when you share comments. We are putting our whole hearts into producing each and every one of these episodes in the uh, real intention to help open hearts and minds and make grand improvements in your life and your relationships. So um, stay tuned for the next episode and thanks for tuning in.